the dirty little secret of America is it's not a free market, right? You know, the, those nasty socialists over there in Europe have a competitive electricity space. In Australia, the reason the solar adoption is off the hook, we do two and a half gigawatts a year in Australia, you know, 50% of cities like Brisbane and Adelaide are powered on rooftop is because they compete for electricity service. And guess what? Customers prefer low cost electricity that also doesn't kill their kids. Danny Kennedy and I first met just a few weeks ago on Twitter when I saw this amazing post, this long thread that he had that was like filled with figures and facts about renewable energy. And in the vast jungle of the internet, it's really easy to find bad information on renewable energy. It's hard to find good information. So I just, my ears perked up, I checked the references and I was really impressed by the work. When I looked into his background, he has a really unique and broad professional background. Starting from the age of 12, he has been involved in environmental activism including stopping irresponsible oil development in Papua New Guinea, to recently installing solar panels on the presidential residence of the Maldives. <laughs> and and uh, he has contributed to and, um, and founded, uh, from my count, this is just based on Wikipedia and my uh, Google stocking, about 12 different organizations that have done everything from in, uh, providing new investment opportunities for renewable energy, to uh, improving local policy and acting as a seed investment group uh, for other people. So I'm really excited to welcome him and I hope that you can join me in giving him a round of applause while I switch over. Thank you, Ben, uh, for that. And well done, the Google stalking worked. You kind of nailed it in a, in a brief paragraph, my 50 years on this mortal coil. Um, so really glad to be here appreciate the opportunity and, and the enthusiasm for the the tweet storm that was just provoked by spending a long weekend pulling together a slide deck and finding all these great you know things in my own workflows that um i thought would be well shared with the the world and and thank you for acknowledging that and what i thought i'd do today actually is just repeat that tweet stream um but speak to it a bit and and get into a conversation with you all because i figure you know that's better as a way of learning i um, happy to take questions as I go through these. I don't know exactly how you facilitate that. I can try to, you know, not race through it, but go pretty quickly. So we get a good 20 or 30 minutes towards the end here to do Q&A. Um, uh, but uh, if that makes sense, I'll, I'll share my screen um, and, and jump in. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to keep it in this format because I need to sort of see what's next. But the, the kind of... You know, the key thing for energy dialogue, I think that people are, are missing because they get stuck in an availability heuristic, which is the mental model from the past that we know. And so it's what we know going forward. Whereas actually the world is changing, it always does, but it's in a period of rapid change in the energy industry, unlike anything it's experienced for a couple of centuries. There were rapid periods of change before when we went from like, carbohydrate based civilizations to hydrocarbon based civilizations but since then the thing's been boiling water to make electricity and blowing up petrol and engines to drive pistons to do movement and motion and, and newton meters and that's all being changed to clean electricity generation without any of the steam boiling business and um, electrification of all the engines the motors to be replaced from the internal or infernal combustion engine, as I call it. Uh, and, and this is, you know, like a, a disruption, to use a cliche from Silicon Valley, that is happening sort of in real time this decade. And the first graph that I'm showing you is, is basically just the, the very small percentage market share of wind and solar electricity, which are the driving forces behind this phenomenon that I'm describing. And it's gone from zero effectively at the start of the century to 10%. But what's important here is it's an exponential curve, not a linear one. And people have trouble seeing bending curves and, and they think in linear curves. And so what's happening here is a rate of doubling. And, and every five years so far this century, the percentage market share of all the electrons in the mix of our grids has gone renewable. 
And, and that is because it's lower cost and better. And it makes sense just innately. There is no fuel input. There is no marginal cost. Once you've built the machine, the machine works without an additional expense. And so from a business point of view, which is where I come at this, that machine's better than any machine that needs a fuel input. And so we're replacing the fuel inputs. Firstly, nukes, because nukes have had a shot at this. They've been around about the same period of solar technology since the 1950s. And every year they get more expensive through time, whereas solar gets less expensive every year, year on year. And, and so next will be the hydro systems because the true costs of those, when you think about the sediment building up behind the reservoirs and the dams of America and the need to decommission them and all those costs, we're gonna take them out and then gas and then coal. And it's already happening and we'll get into that. But the point is we're on the, the heel of a curve, which is gonna get very steep very quickly in the 2020s because the next doubling, what is it? 10.5% of market share today. Five years from now, that's 21%. 10 years from now, that's 42%. 15 years from now, that's 84%. And then the next five year doubling, we, we meet saturation. Like we know that's going to happen. That's a technology adoption curve, which you and I have lived through, say with landline telephony. That was a service that was built on a technology a hundred years ago. We did phone calls tied to the wall with a curly piece of string. We replaced it with cell phones because they were better and cheaper to transmit communications. And they have completely destroyed landline telephony. That is what's happening in electricity. It's, it's, a, it's a very familiar story. The, the next slide is just like other examples of technologies that have experienced S curves of adoption of a new technology until they meet saturation. The S tops out and plateaus because you get to 100% market share. Um, while the, you know, really it's an X curve of destruction because another technology is replaced. In economistic terms, Schumpeter described this as the gale of creative destruction. Something is replaced by something new that is better and cheaper. One interesting dynamic with this sort of system is that the new system that replaces the old system is actually bigger. You know, so take the cell phone analogy, which is simple enough to understand at the level of landlines and cell phones. But actually, when you think about it, we've done a lot more than just replace what we did with landline telephones with our cell phones, right? They're now supercomputers in our pockets by which we also do Slack and Slido. And we also do Facebook and stuff we didn't even imagine was needed in the world 20 years ago. But the power of the bundle of technologies, which is just not the cell phone, but the, 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 the packet of communications data that can be transmitted by satellite, that is the, the microchip that allows you to have in your pocket a computer which has more capacity to compute ones and zeros than NASA had when we sent humans to the moon. All, all that in this package has enabled new services, new innovation on the top of the cell phone, which is greater than um, the old system by a country mile. And, and yet you sit here in the point of change as that wheel of destruction is happening, as the point of doubling is coming up from 1%. 1% feels like nothing, which is where solar is as a percentage of market share in many countries. And everyone says, it's nothing. Bill Gates said, like, it's cute, but it's not serious. But he forgot what he'd done himself by bringing a computer to every home. 1% is only seven doublings from 100%. 1%, 2%, 4%, 8%, 16%, 32%, 64 you get the story. So we're going there now. You know, when President Biden announced a couple of weeks ago, America is going to be 50% solar powered by 2050, like that's a big stretch. That's the track we're on. We'll beat that. <laughs> so um, the, this is kind of like, the first awareness that people need when they consider energy in the 2020s, which I guess is what your careers and training are about, it's changing dramatically for the better. You know, it's cheaper, it's cleaner. We can build it faster to provision new services to people, including the billion on earth that don't even know what electricity is, really. Um, and, and we don't have to boil the planet as we go. Just to reinforce the point of the system change, there's a, there's a critical piece to this, which is the battery. 
the bundle of generation technologies. You know, at the start of the century, there was a legitimate question. I used to work for, you know, Greenpeace and do energy analysts and, and, and work like that. And, you know, will it be wet renewables, you know, wave and tidal power? Will it be run of river hydro? Will it be geothermal? Will it be nukes? Will it be carbon capture and storage on fossil fuel systems? Will it be wind? Will it be solar? Two decades later, the answer is basically in. If you take the clock seriously that we have on climate change, we have to work with what we've got. We're not going to commercialize many new technologies in the time we have to, to fix this. And the technologies that have worked and have shown aggressive learning curves, which means they get cheaper for every doubling of volume, uh, are wind and solar, basically. And so we've got the generation story. And you know, finally, the International Energy Agency last year came around and acknowledged this and deemed it the king of electricity. And you know, even Shell will tell you by 2070, maybe 2100, the dominant resource in the electricity system will be the solar, system, solar power. It has to be by 2050, 2040, if we're going to survive here well with the climate scenario. The missing piece to that package to really unleash the magic, you know, let the genie out of the bottle is the battery. Just as with the cell phone, you know, the supercomputing microchip with the GPRS, GSM information communication technology and a battery was needed that could power that thing, the lithium ion rechargeable battery, which was only invented in the 1970s and commercialized for your first Sony Walkman in the 1980s. Those three things came together made that disruption possible in telephony and supercomputing in our pockets. Likewise, the battery on the grid and in the mobility sector is the, the game changer that completes this story. And there's a really interesting U-curve of energy cost, which describes an optimum, which I'm not going to get into unless you want me to, um, where the, the, the design of the grids of the future will actually have much more generation than we think we need because the capex or the capital expense of the storage is high. And so we'll minimize the amount of storage batteries to, to optimize the cost of the electrons in the system. But what it will mean is we'll actually be living in abundance. We'll actually have more electricity than we know what to do with. Just as when you think about it, the cell phone and virtual you know, computing and stuff unleash more computing power than we thought we needed. And so we invented purposes for it social media, you know, some good, some bad, I guess, but there will be an abundance of this power and we will do things with it that we need in the world. Hopefully electrify everyone that needs it, displace all the fossil fuels that we need, but also potentially desalinate water so we have enough water for everyone. Irrigate land, you know, uh, make hydrogen, do what we think is a, a public good with this superpower that is the abundance of electricity that will come out of an optimally developed energy market. And, and obviously electrify all the transport fleets. Cars are the least amongst them. Is that all making sense as like the big picture setup for where we're going? Someone, I gotta get some feedback here. I'm feeling like I'm talking into the void. <laughs> yeah, should we all say yes or no at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and, and tell me if I'm boring or telling you stuff you know too, if, if this is too much. Um, the, the, the track we're on is, as I say, you know. Danny, there's one question. Yes. Um, so the slide that you were just on, um, I'm curious what that one times, two times, three times, that generating capacity, what is that in kilowatt hours? So that, that's the point that we'll actually build out more generation than we think we need. So for example, in, in real weather data terms in California, um, this, this model was run over like a, a tract of three years of solar and wind um, resource. And, you know, to meet demand, you would build a certain amount of solar and wind capacity, like three times as much solar because the capacity factor of solar is, um, you know, only six to eight hours, say, depending on where you are in California. Uh, you know, it doesn't run 24 hours because it goes dark at night. So you need to build three times as much generation and then store some of it in batteries. But what you, you realize is that if you oversupply because of where the demand peaks and troughs with generation, which is the lowest cost electricity, I mean, we're currently producing solar power at two and three cents a kilowatt hour in the world. Like that's the cheapest electricity ever in dollar adjusted terms from any technology anywhere. 
So that's going to halve again with the next doubling. Well, it's a bigger problem. It's going to go down 20% by the learning curve with the next doubling. Um, so uh, it keeps going down, say, to one cent kilowatt hour or sub one cent, almost free electricity. So you just flood the field with electricity and you only build a lesser amount of storage, hence the battery above the 4x solar generating capacity is smaller than the battery by the 1x, if that makes sense. So the optimum is less spend on storage because batteries are expensive, more spend on generation because wind and solar are cheap. But what it results in is you're generating four times as much power electrons in the grid as you consume, which is this weird kind of like, we currently call this a problem. We curtail electricity. Like this happens on a Sunday in California right now. We have you know fewer industrial loads running. People are vegging around at home, not doing whatever they do. And there's more wind and solar power being generated than we need. And so we literally sometimes shunt it into the sand. Like, you know, don't need that. You know, there, there are negative pricing events in Europe. Australia has a problem with too much solar coming off rooftops. That's not a problem, that's electricity. What are we gonna do with it is the question. Guess what? We're gonna attract other industrial uses and offtakes for that electricity, things that are dispatchable loads or flexible demands. And then those industries are gonna pay for the electricity. We're gonna share the cost of it. The electricity is gonna become even cheaper, a fraction of zero or you know, less than one cent a kilowatt hour. And we're gonna have this, what I call abundance or superpower phenomenon like computing. We have more than we know we need. We're sticking computers in shoes and glasses and God knows what, because we've now made it so cheap. You know, Wi-Fi is free on the streets of America. You sit in a cafe and you get what you used to pay just 10 years ago, $2 a minute for. That's electricity in the not too distant future. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, not to belabor the point, uh, solar's amazing. Uh, <laughs> And it's happening at a this is a log scale you know rate that we don't quite see because we're stuck in our pasts but you know again just to give you the the stairway to heaven here up and to the right is where businesses want to go this is an incredible phenomenon for any industry this is the actual additions to the grid so you know what we're expecting this year 2021 is maybe 154 gigawatts of addition to the grid you know take the capacity factor count 50 gigs call it tell me when we built 50 gigs worth of coal in the world or or nukes in one 12 month period you can't permit a nuclear plant in a decade <laughs> you know like it, the 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 ability for this stuff to grow like a weed you know we'll do 200 gigs next year they're projecting a 2022 200 gigawatt year it's it's kind of like in the history of electricity, since Edison and Tesla and, and Westinghouse were fighting over this stuff, no one thought humans could add this generating capacity to the mix. And yet it's what we're actually doing in real time right now in an industry valued at, you know, $100 billion plus and growing at 30% CAGR, which is truly remarkable. And why? Simply cost. I mean, like all the environmental benefits, of course, climate change, the social reality that it's power that can sit in the hands of the people on their own roofs, in their own ownership, rather than centralized and concentrated as wealth for the few. All those co-benefits are true, but the real reason that this is just taking off is solar has dropped in cost by like 90% in a decade. Nothing like it has happened in, in these technology sets. And, and the thing is, the more you do it, the cheaper it gets. It's a it's a flat plate semiconductor. It's not a machine with things that spin. It doesn't have any moving parts. It doesn't degrade when you put it out in the environment. It doesn't reduce its, its use. I mean, it's warranted for a 25 year life, but actually it probably works for 50. What then is the cost of the electron that comes out of it in year 46? When you've already amortized all of the, the cost of it, you've paid for it. Every electron coming out of it is free. That machine just sits in the sun and makes electricity as the sun comes up and falls fresh from the sky onto this flat plate product. So we're gonna do a lot of solar because we're gonna make electricity cheap and abundant. And that's what's happening. And the world does know this in its heart of hearts or in its cynical markets. And, and, and the shock is coming, you know, and it is a shock because we've built for a couple centuries, industrial 
economies and communities dependent on the inputs to the other system, which are these once through fuels that get aspirated into the sky and cause climate change, they are in not, not cyclical declines, but structural declines. They are dying the way asbestos died or the way the horse and buggy went away as a common transport option in America. That's happening. Coal is gone. Oil is flat. We'll probably never reach another peak of 100 million barrels like it did in 2019. Even though there's, you know, like there's noise today, there's a high price of oil in the news and people think, oh, oil's back. A day does not make a trend. The trend is clear because the economics of these things, the more you use them is exactly the opposite of what I said about solar. The more you use it, it becomes cheaper. The more you use a finite resource, the more expensive it becomes. And at the end of the day, we are kind of rational economic beasts and we do do the low cost thing. So, you know, as I say, history is being written in the, these days and weeks and months and years. The, the United States has gone back in coal consumption to where it was a long, long time ago and it'll never come back again. Um, the, you know, there's a coalition for Glasgow which is trying to make that true around the world. Britain, the, the, the country that brought us steam powered industrialization, blew through this a while ago. They, they got no worries. I mean, they're having another bubble right now with gas prices and electricity prices, but they are, they are not the signal. They are the noise in the, in the system. Um, even in these high growth emerging economies where we work a lot at New Energy Nexus, trying to support this energy transition with entrepreneurs and financial innovation to take place, where there is huge and, and, and just and righteous energy aspiration and demand. You know, these are populations who do not live high on the hog like we do here in the States and in Britain, have not benefited from the, the, the history of polluting the atmosphere with no consequences for us so much as for others. But um, these countries that have real energy needs are working out it's better, cheaper, faster to do it with clean and, and to phase out the coal. Uh, and, and the fossil fuels. And that's important because these countries are where the climate will be determined, which is the point of this slide. Just to say like what the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, what we do is, is important and we have to do right by everyone and, and our own kids, you know, clean energy is good local air pollution wise and indoor air pollution wise and all of it. But you know, where the world has moved, where the economy is the largest is already Asia. And where the growth will be in energy demand, energy services as the sort of, you know, the, the commanding heights of the economy as they were once described, is Asia, uh, by which I mean the greater Asia region, but is a place with more people than the rest of the world combined. And, and we have to skate to where the puck is going. So take a, an example of a country like Indonesia, which is the size of America, you know, population wise, it's about the same, 300 million people thereabouts. The average consumption per kilowatt hour per, per capita is about a thousand kilowatt hours per annum in Indonesia. You, you and I are probably 10,000 if we're good citizens being energy efficient with electric vehicles. <laughs> so the the aspiring middle classes of indonesia young people by by demographics are going to grow their energy consumption and so they should because they currently don't enjoy all the services we take and they they want to do that and build their businesses and industry if they do it with the coal that they have in indonesia and kalimantan it really is, doesn't matter so much what we do here in california or you do it in, in um, your part of the, the world and, and so on. So that's where we have to work. But the good news is it's happening there too. You know, Vietnam, a very large country, you know, which we sadly carpet bombed just a generation ago, has come out of that and decided to do this. And just, you know, in the last four years has adopted solar in a way that even I, as like a bull on this stuff, couldn't even comprehend. They went from, you know, dozens of megawatts to gigawatts in a few short years installed on a rooftop. Um, so, you know, the, the, the disruption point is, is happening all around the globe. And, and, you know, 
we, we have trouble understanding this, like students, academics, agencies which are paid for it, bankers which bet on it, all of us have this trouble with that S curve, the exponential, like how steep is that gonna be, the heel of it? We're, we're here, right? We, we sort of saw it's trending upwards. It's about to get really vertical. How quickly will it go vertical? Will that rate of doubling increase? Will it slow down and tilt over? That's all policy, politics, markets, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship will determine the rate of acceleration. That it will peak and go to 100% plus of the market share, not a question anymore. And what's the good news is we tend to be exceeding our forecasts. You know, the IEA is sort of famous for missing the solar phenomenon for the last couple of decades until, like I said, last year, they kind of capitulated and went, oh, you're right, solar is going to crush it all because it persistently and consistently delivers lower cost electricity across the board. Um, so yes, we will revise our forecasts and hopefully for the better year on year, because you know the only other rate which is accelerating faster than we anticipated is the rate of change in the weather, if you haven't noticed. Again, good news from Asia is there's a lot of innovation happening and game-changing things like this. I mean, again, I'm a solar guy, so you know it's just one of these points that I drew out in my Twitter thing that hasn't gotten much gloss because it's not an American invention, which tends to be where the trade press focuses. But sea-based solar farms, so mounting photovoltaics on ocean. We do this, we call it photovoltaics on like reservoirs for dams and things around the world. That's quite a common practice now and it, it links neatly to the grid often. But once you have the low cost place to put it, you're not competing for land. You're not trying to stick it on tricky roof spaces or the skin of the building. There is like, this becomes very cheap at scale. It's quite a remarkable innovation that a Singaporean business has just announced a two gigawatt deployment of this scale, two gigawatts. Like, you know, that's a, that's a nuke. Um, so I'm gonna move to storage in a sec, but I just wanna check if I've lost you. You have it. Uh, the questions are, we've got about 14 questions online, but most of them I think will be best served at the end. But anybody have a clarification question, either online or here, that we need to talk about now? Everybody's in total rapt attention, Danny. So we just want to keep on <laughs> listening to what you have to say, and then we'll have questions at the end. So, you know, um, the, the other point I made was that, you know, the battery is the, 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 the key that unlocks the door to opportunity. The batteries that were invented with lithium, but also sodium batteries and zinc batteries and other chemistries will come to scale and fruition. Lithium will always be key because of its place in the periodic table. If you remember hydrogen, helium, lithium, it's very high energy, lightweight element. Um, that's coming and, and coming at scale, largely deployments, for example, here in the, mostly in California, but the US on grid energy storage, because batteries can do what we need to complete the whole picture. Like, you know, there is a, a problem with the variability of wind and solar resources. They do create challenges to grid managers and voltage conditioning and all these details that you might be getting into in your engineering courses or wherever. And we use gas to ramp up and down to meet duct curves and all these kinds of things. Batteries can do that for us. And that's why batteries will um, go to scale and, and they, they like photovoltaics become cheaper the more you make them. That's why they're coming down to hundred dollars a kilowatt hour with Tesla and electric vehicles driving demand for the mass manufacturing of them in gigafactories around the world, which is springing up like nobody's business. And batteries, or rather EVs are batteries on wheels. So we, we forget, like it's one of these synergistic network effects where we're innovating on the grid and electricity supply. We're trying to jailbreak that cheap electricity and put it into the, the vehicles we drive to displace the internal combustion engine as a strategy, but it synergistically supports the grid. Those, those batteries on wheels become assets for the grid, whether they're demand response assets, demand management, flexible load assets for the problem I described earlier, or whether they're a vehicle to building asset, like the new Ford F-150, the Lightning actually can charge you home. If there's downtime in the grid, like in Texas earlier this year, 
plug in your F-150 and run your house on it for three days or vehicle to grid itself. Like it's a, it's an actual storage element ancillary service provider in, in the system. And, um, you know, electric cars are going to be massively adopted at scale. This year is surprising us again, way faster than we projected even for six months ago, because electric cars, electric bikes, electric buses are simply better. You know, the electric school bus doesn't poison your kids in the back seat, doesn't cost your transit agency a fortune and fluctuating variable costs of diesel. You can fix the contract against the electricity rate. And, you know, over the lifetime, the, that bus just runs better. It doesn't have belts. It doesn't have oil. It doesn't have any of those problems that break down all the time. So the total cost of ownership is far less as it is with electric cars. I mean, I'm sure you've heard all of this, but it's now being realized at a rate of change again, which even a bull like me didn't foresee. I mean, here's a fun fact for you. Two wheel vehicles in the world, you know, very big market, 75 million two wheelers sold last year, even in COVID, 24 million of them were electric. A third of all two wheelers on earth. You don't see it because you're sitting where you're sitting. Asia, which is where the demand for two wheelers is, the crowded cities of India, Indonesia, Malaysia, China, et cetera, it's all going two wheel electric and three wheel electric. 85% of vehicle miles traveled in, in India are in rickshaws and on motorbikes. And they're all going electric. Like the rate of doubling there is not five percent every five years, it's like every year. So this is coming. And to be blunt, we have to thank China for this because they both drove the mass production that made the batteries cheap enough, firstly to power our cell phones and our laptops, then to power their two-wheel vehicles and now to power their buses and their cars. And you know, the, the market share per month is growing to like 50% in some provinces in China. And remember, a province in China is like a small country. And, and so that's happening. I mean, it's also happening in Norway, in Europe, uh, but Norway is a small country. Like the big driver of demand um, is definitely been China. And, and we're gonna have to thank them for their front running this phenomenon and providing us low cost batteries, low cost electric vehicles, low cost batteries on wheels to make, make our um, grid whole and, and complete with the renewable generation that's coming at scale also. All of this is described to me in this excellent diagrammatic representation of this you know, gale of creative destruction. This is from Rethink X and I encourage you to look at their work online. But the, the reason the X curve happens, the, the new rising curve of a technology takes over and displaces a, a worse technology is, is described pretty well here. You, you get more demand from all the benefits, more variety, lower costs. Think about electric vehicles versus cars that currently. Economies of scale make them cheaper. Better capabilities make them more attractive. They've got more public acceptance because they don't kill people in, in, through pollution. All of which leads to higher revenues, margins, ability to invest in R&D, make them better, and political will, public license, entrepreneurial state intervention, all that. Whereas the opposite is true of the old technology set. That's what's happening in the world. And it's, it's you know, just in time, hopefully, because the weather is weird for reasons we understand in science. We've, we've screwed the pooch, if you'll excuse my French, and we've, <laughs> We put too much carbon in the sky and we have a problem, Houston. Um, but it is, it is the case that it's changing. Um, I'm not gonna continue with this so that we can go to questions. There are some technologies that work and some that don't. Carbon capture doesn't, um, just you know, as a reality. Don't get sucked into believing that the fossil fuel industry is gonna build a new solution in the next decade when it hasn't for the last three decades of promises. Um, and also don't get complacent. Don't believe me to the point that you think, oh, it's all handled, we're gonna be okay. We need to put our shoulders to that wheel and spin that flywheel faster. It is true, it's picking up momentum, but it needs you, it needs young people, it needs student energy to get behind it because we have to deploy a shit ton of these technologies that exist, the solar wind, the batteries. We also have to invent 
a bunch of things. The, the, the grid edge computing, the, the smarts and the intelligence layer to manage all these just-in-time supply and demand technologies, uh, maybe some other bits on the edges, the geothermal, the new lithium recovery operations from salt water, whatever the, the innovation is, it will not end. Humans continue to be ingenious and, and grow and, and do new things. We have to do new things, but we also have to do what we know how to do now at speed and scale, unlike any period in history. That solar sort of adoption curve has to go up and to the right further faster. So get involved, get hungry, go at it. It's a good place to be. Um, and I'm open for questions. But while people are ranking them, there's one that's come up at the top. Um, what have you found is the best way to communicate the reality of climate change and the need for renewable energy, especially to people who are skeptical or who are caught up in kind of older narratives? The best way is to sit down and, you know, uh, ask questions, I think. You know, what's your lived experience of the weather? I, I don't think there's anyone on earth that's been around for more than five years that can't say they haven't seen changes. And I know that sounds a little unscientific because weather works on longer timeframes than that. But, you know, most people will be real about the fires, the floods, the, the storm formation. These things are happening in real time. We know that. Um, and if you ask them honestly to reflect on their lived experience, I mean, questions are better in brain science than, than lectures, right? Yeah. So that's how I would go about that question. Um, I'll be honest, I, I don't have a whole lot of time to spend with people that sort of dig in on an ideological or a scientific um, position. Like, if you want to be like that in the 21st century, that's on you but we've got children and, and a world to save. Thank you, Danny. The, the next question is, um, what are the, you know, you've, you've convinced all of us that the technology is there, the economics are there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to happen on the right time frame. So what are the national, state, and local barriers currently slowing the rollout of renewables, and what can we do to accelerate this process? <laughs> you know, I mean, you're exactly right in the question, whoever asked it, that, you know, politics is the risk here, that we get in our own way as people, because we've got, you know, preempts, despite our rhetoric around free markets and capitalism and whatever, these things happening because of vested interests, basically, and corruption is what it is. And, and you know, it's manifest in the United States very dramatically in campaign finance and the like. And, and, you know, just in the last 24 hours, you're seeing it, you're seeing an old guard kicking in to resist an infrastructure investment which america has de delayed for decades i mean you know a couple tr three trillion dollars is not a lot of money in a country this size with the broken ass business we got you know like our grids are literally <laughs> 1970s at best I, I know the technology intimately you know like here in california we've had towns burned down because hooks broke and wires fell in forests and burnt them and killed 89 people in paradise you know like this is no joke this is a crumbling infrastructure from a hundred years ago that now has a potential to be replaced. And we're choosing for reasons I don't understand in Congress not to do it, you know, like we're having a debate about it. Like what, what is, what are we thinking here? So what do we need to do? I mean, work that out. Firstly, that's on someone at a higher level of uh, strategy and sophistication than I, I've, I've felt for a long time, any, any, path that leads through Congress is a bad path. Um, I, I do think you have uh, a lot of work to do at state level and policies like America is really 50 electricity markets and energy markets. Like when you think about where the regulations are set, FERC is a player, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but most electricity mandates, policies, rules, settings are state material for the public utility commissions. Um, so work on those, get behind the, the pro-solar, pro-storage, pro-electrification stratagems and policies and settings. You know, there are great organizations I could point you to, like Vote Solar, I was on the board of for a long time. Um, other things uh, that do good work in that, that regard um, and just unleash the beast. And then, you know, lo locally, likewise, there's a lot of power locally for, you know, codes and, and design of cities and zoning to make livable, walkable, locally powered cities that you know are empowered literally and figuratively by this technology set you know this is busting up trusts you know these crazy monopoly utilities we have in this country i mean 
the dirty little secret of America is it's not a free market, right? You know, the, those nasty socialists over there in Europe have a competitive electricity space. In Australia, the reason the solar adoption is off the hook, we do two and a half gigawatts a year in Australia, you know, 50% of cities like Brisbane and Adelaide are powered on rooftop is because they compete for electricity service. And guess what? Customers prefer low cost electricity that also doesn't kill their kids. So they choose it. <laughs> you don't have that choice in America is the truth. So we've got to change all that. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we've been learning about one of our ecological laws is there, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, right? So everything has a, an environmental footprint. And this next question speaks to that. There's now a waste neutral smartphone. How do we get there with solar and wind energy production? How can we mitigate the negative environmental and social impacts that might accompany some of these changes? Really brilliant stuff. Thank you for being such a smart class and asking the right questions. Um, good, you know, point that we need to do this better than the last one. The good news is particularly photovoltaics are recyclable. Whether they are recycled, of course, is the question. But, you know, when you think about it, like the bundle is a, an aluminium frame, a glass top of silicon cells, a back sheet and some electronics, all of which are metals which can be recycled if harvested there's a bit of a problem with the back sheet it's called a layer of plastic but we could probably do without that just as we substituted lead out of the solder of pv about 15 years ago now i think um, so we can design for recycling and recycle and literally have a closed loop like you could do not an open loop recycling scenario but you could have the machine called photovoltaics built in the 2020s run for its life, which is probably a century. And then you could break it down in the 2120s and build another solar panel out of it. Like the material is, is that robust. And truly lithium batteries are, are largely the same. You know, one of the reasons Redwood Materials is opening up in, in middle America is to recycle the cobalt. And the economics on that right now are excellent because cobalt's such a, a precious mineral and being extracted at great cost in, of human rights in the Congo for our laptops and our cars and stuff. So we can do this. It is a closed loop potential circular economy needs policy politics to, to ensure extended producer responsibility and that, it, that it's captured and recycled or reused in the first phase for second life before being recycled. But I will say another thing, which is I get this question a lot and, and it's not wrong at all, but let's just be very real about what we did for the last couple of centuries and we got ourselves pretty comfortable with, which was dug up landscapes literally go to wyoming go to navajo you know go anywhere where there's been a coal mine an oil facility a gas plant the fracking fields of america right now we've destroyed people in place for centuries in pursuit of fossil fuels which are once through the system right you dig them up ship them somewhere burn them blow them up in a car whatever you do and then they go up into the sky as carbon dioxide and other air pollutants and then you have ash and you dispense of that and it, it's not usable for nothing. And we, we as Americans use about 6,000 tons of that per annum. You and I each. The lifestyle that we have, if powered by clean electricity with electric transport, would require about 50 pounds of silicon, lithium, and steel metals each. Like the footprint calculus is a fraction, like literally a, a, a single digit percentage of the annual footprint of the fossil fuel lifestyle. Yeah. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up too bad. There will be a footprint. And like, I'm, a, I'm an environmentalist, like I was described since 12 years old. There are trade-offs in life. We are probably gonna extract stuff from the earth's core. There will be environmental impacts they will be significantly less when we make this energy transition. Thank you so much. Um, this next question is a little bit more on the professional entrepreneurial side. How can current college students get involved in this renewable energy revolution? Where is the most innovation, thought, energy, jobs needed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, everywhere. And where is it not is probably my question to you. but. If you're not getting offered it at your university, move. I mean, I think you are by merit of meeting Ben, but, um, you know, go online, 
Coursera's got a great energy 101 thing I did, you know, like um, educate yourself, energy skills, uh, transition, energy transition skills are available by many means, entrepreneurial support are available, have a crack at it. We're big backers of an organization called Student Energy. I don't know if they're active on Brigham Young campus, but they're a charity out of Canada that has campus clubs and, and teams in a hundred countries, I think, you know, 50,000 members. And a lot of what they do is start enterprises, just practice things on campus, a micro mobility business here, a solar project there, whatever it is. Um, we're trying to back them with a fund. We just actually announced a climate week last week in New York, where we will in, you know, help manage money and grants into these student enterprises to get going, just to have a go at it. Because entrepreneuring is a, is a, a struggle, you know, like it's a, a, you know, try and fail and fail fast and try again and get it right and grow. And, you know, that's the story of famous startups, like, you know, whatever you care to name, Apple or whatever, um, 10 years of travail and overnight, then you're an overnight success is kind of the joke here for us that have actually started businesses. You got to have a go and just get into it, roll up your sleeves. I wouldn't recommend do too much professional training, honestly, like this may be speaking against the, the academic kind of track, but I, I'm a big believer in getting your hands dirty. Um, I, I have a science degree and did a professional life as an activist before becoming an entrepreneur and investor. And if I can do it, you can. Thank you so much. Um, we're at the end of the time. I know some people are gonna have to leave, but if you, if you do have time, there's, there's a, there are a few questions that are thinking more about the opposition to this change. And what have you seen with trends in misinformation on renewable energy and how generally are the fossil fuel industries responding to these changes? Uh, I mean, you know, I have seen it all. <laughs> I've been doing this for too long. And I've been, you know, a recipient of death threats and I, I've been told to be a liar and, and sued and, and, you know, all sorts of things have been said about this trend that are falsehoods and, and misinformation. Wow. Obviously, in this era, the ability to generate misinformation and make it look more credible is, is high, as you mentioned, Ben, in the intro um, with social media, for example. But, um, you know, it's a stratagem of the the vested interest or the status quo, whatever we call the establishment of, of, any, of any phenomenon that is going to be undone, you know, the, the monarchs of Europe, for example, against the, you know, the fledgling ideas of liberty, equality and fraternity, you know, they used tools and stratagems to obfuscate and delay changes, right? That's, that's the thing. I mean, Gandhi used to say, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. We've been through the ignoring stage. That was 1990s. This is nothing. Don't worry about it. Then they laughed at us in the noughties and, and 2010 era. And the, oh my God, that crap is all sorts of tools and stratagems to do that. And so it's, it's in the, the state houses, it's in the Congress, it's in the places where they can buy defense because have, you know, wealth inherited from a century of exploitation. Um, don't know whether that's answering the question explicitly. Well, I just wanted to say on behalf of the class, and we had about 100 people, 70 here in the class and uh, over 30 online, we really appreciate you taking the time. Why don't we give uh, Danny a round of applause? Thank you. And um, if you would be willing to share any resources, I will circulate those with the class afterwards. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep watching you on Twitter. Anyone here uh, who's interested, please get involved in environmental science and sustainability at BYU. There's a new office of sustainability, a new major, some information up here, and a, a horse that we found uh, in a dumpster someplace. So, <laughs> thank you again, Danny. Really appreciate it. And uh, all the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good luck. Warming with her melting ground. Fruitless hunting, swimming round and round Dissolution of your home Of all 
you've loved and all that you've known and you are starving and we are watching and we